in the previous lecture, we got to the point where um, we realized that if we had a um, finite section, so the uh, n by n uh, part of the infinite dimensional Kupman matrix, uh, even if that was approximate, so if we if we uh, cut off the time averages at some finite number of points m, um, we could somehow approximate the eigenfunction phi if we found the eigenvector of the finite section and then multiplied it with the members of the of the uh, library f tilde. So f tilde is the library of functions that consists of components f1 to fn. Um, of course, if if the the uh, finite section is really associated with a finite dimensional and invariant subspace, then this would be exact. If we could find A exactly and we knew F tildes everywhere, then, then this would be exact. But in general, this would be an approximation. And <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk about how accurate these approximations are and in which sense a little bit further, further down the line. Uh, but now I'd like to discuss another important concept in the uh, Kupman operator theory. So we have two very classical um, uh, spectral components, and that's uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Now we are going to talk about modes, Kupman modes. I, I call them in, in, in the paper where uh, uh, where they were first presented. I, I call them shape modes and the 2005 papers, but later we named them uh, Koopman modes after the Koopman, Koopman operator. But they were discovered only in that 2005 uh, paper. So uh, we have the spectral triple, the eigenvalues, the eigenfunctions, which can be approximately like this from a finite section. And now we're going to try to find the modes also from the finite section. So what is a Koopman mode? In general, a Koopman mode is, is the projection of a field of observables on an eigenfunction of u. So we find the eigenfunction. And then in principle, uh, we could take a projection that P, P, let's call it P phi, projection onto the eigenspace uh, spanned by the eigenfunction if we could do that computation. But uh, we're going to see that there is a, a bit of a more direct method uh, from, uh, you know, by using a finite section. And so uh, as, as before, we denote by u n tilde a finite section of u tilde, which is the Koopman matrix. This is infinite. This is finite n by n. And then h is going to be a vector observable. So a field of observables indexed over discrete sets. So for example, if you had a, a fluid flow, and if you were measuring velocities and number of discrete spatial points, those measurements could be elements of this vector H. In this case, uh, we would be mapping at a real subspace of this CK. K is the dimension of H. So we would be mapping to a real subspace. But uh, in general, we are allowing complex observables as, as before. And so the, the Koopman mode associated with the eigenvalue lambda of U is obtained by taking that vector H inner producting with the dual of phi. For this, of course, we need the dual to exist. So phi should, um, all the eigenfunctions should form some kind of a basis. That's not always the case, but in, in, this, in this particular case, we can write the Koopman mode as, as uh, described here. And so now I'm going to want to find this or rather find this expression because this would require getting the dual and the inner producting and so on and so forth. I do have the eigenfunction already uh, as an approximation from previously, but I'd like to find it from the finite section in a more straightforward way. So let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, so let's by aj or j1 to n denote the eigenvectors of u tilde n. And so the associated eigenfunctions of the finite section are phi j is a j dotted with f tilde, just like before. Of course, I am assuming here 
that phi j's, you know, that uh, f tilde span and invariant subspace. In general, this is not ca the case, and this is going to be only an approximation. Yes, only an approximation. But let's let's proceed with that assumption, and then we'll estimate the what kind of errors in that approximation could appear a little bit later. So aj here consists of components one to n. And now we're going to see that the dual basis, this, these dual, dual functions to eigenfunctions, um, are obtained by inner producting a dual eigenvector, yes, with g hat. This vector contains the duals to chosen library of functions here. And so, uh, 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 so recall that if I have a basis of eigenvectors a k, then the dual basis a j hat satisfies this relationship with the canonical delta. And so let's now let's now check that this definition here indeed provides us with dual eigenfunctions. So take an inner product between phi j and phi i hat. If phi i hats are really the dual eigenfunctions, then this should give us a Kronecker delta. So indeed, write phi j as in components as a sum of a j k f k. These are the basis vectors. And then phi i hat, okay, we defined it as these a hats. These are components of the dual eigenvectors, those we know, we can compute both the eigenvectors of, of, the, of the finite section and the duals, multiplying g l hat, that was by definition, all right? So now let's take the sum out, multiplying a j k and f k, <clears throat> sorry, a j k and a i l hat, uh, uh, because of the complex inner product, we are going to have the complex conjugation here. When we do that operation, then we're going to keep this part in the inner product. That's f k and g l hat in the inner product notation, and this clearly gives us the Kronecker delta k l because these are duals to each other. So this k and that l both become k. So we have some from k is one to n of a j k a hat c i k. Yes. And since a's and a hats are dual to each other, that's really a j delta j i. And so we proved that this definition of a dual eigenfunction is indeed a good one. Okay. So now we have the element that we need to find the Koopman mode associated with a vector of observables h. All right. So since that, and I'm, I'm writing this now as an approximation because I'm assuming that I don't, I don't have exact phi j's and phi j's hats. I, I either cut off those sums, you know, time averages at finite m, or I don't have an invariant subspace, something like that. So sj tilde here denotes that it's produced out of a finite uh, finite section that might not correspond to an invariant subspace or when I cut off the time averaging um, at, at some finite uh, m as I need to if I'm doing things numerically, but then I have an inner product between h and phi j hat. We plug in the definition of phi j hat, that's a j k hat g k hat sum over k. a j k hat goes out. And then, and then uh, the inner product between H and GK uh, hat uh, 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 is left in, and then phi J. And now, if we so if we assume that H is equal to F tilde, so we we actually are doing the Koopman modes associated with the original with the original um, um, set of observables. Then we are going to get um, f tilde phi j hat phi j is equal to copying this 
but then F tilde and G carry hat, you see F tilde has F1 to Fn here. And only one of those elements gives us a inner product that is one when inner product with JK and the rest of them are zeros. So for that particular K, yeah, we get one and that for everything else is zero. So when we sum over each of these elements, the vector that comes out from that inner product and taking into account um, this coefficient here is aj hat phi j. The coupon modes associated with the data vector of observables are obtained as left eigenvector of the finite section of the Koopman of the Koopman operator. So this is the way we got <clears throat> um, we got um, Koopman modes, so Koopman eigenfunctions are obtained from right eigenvectors and Koopman modes are obtained using the left eigenvectors. Now, of course, phi j is a scalar. So the j mode is really multiplied by the scalar. Very often we call the mode really the normalized um, value of this. So of course, modes are only just like eigenvectors and eigenfunctions always defined only up to a, up to a constant. All right, <clears throat> so now we're going to ask the, qu the following question. Um, now that we know how to compute the Koopman modes and eigenfunctions, can we now use this for um, more the reconstruction of the data and maybe a prediction one step forward? So let's write the approximate finite section. So remember the approximation is obtained when we cut off at finite m, so finite time average. Let's write it in its spectral decomposition. So if you use the matrix A, that is a, a, a matrix of eigenvectors and columns, then lambda is uh, the diagonal matrix that has eigenvalues on, on the diagonal. We are assuming distinct eigenvalues here just for, for simplicity. <clears throat> and so uh, then uh, utilizing this, um, we can write UNA tilde from previous work. Remember it was more Penrose inverse. We call this F plus. So this here, this part was called F plus. And here we have F prime. This is the data matrix, right? But shifted one step forward. So that's F1 of T. T is the transformation that we are an analyzing. Tx to Fn. Of Tx. Right, and so you should remember that F1, uh, in the column that, uh, uh, the, the first column here is the function F1, the observable evaluated at, at, at Tx, right? And X is the set of points on a trajectory. So it's really uh, a, a vector thing there. So that's, F prime. Okay. So now uh, let's observe that from here and here, if we um, multiply from the left by F dagger F, we obtain this formula here. <clears throat> so on the right hand side, uh, we know everything. We collected data in this matrix F, yes? So that's up to time M. And so we have all this data. F dagger is just the Hermitian conjugate of that. So complex conjugate and transpose. A, we know we obtain the, uh, 
these eigenvectors from finite section lambda we know that contains eigenvalues and a we know a inverse we know from a now the one that we don't know is f prime but if you read this every column of f prime has m unknowns and for every column this represents actually a a set of n capital n equations yeah so if m which is the number of points on a trajectory is bigger than n then that's an underdetermined set of equations right so we can have many solutions for columns of f prime and in that case if we um, if we uh, write this f prime p and uh, that we obtain by hitting this expression by again the more penrose inverse from the left so if 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 this thing was invertible we could just multiply it from the left by f dagger inverse and we would have an exact solution but since it's m by n we multiply it by this whole thing and that's really the projection of all these possible solutions on the subspace that's spanned by columns of the data matrix. So in some sense, we are saying, well, you know, let me let me let me get the projection on the the span of data that that I have collected, and I'm going to proclaim that to be the solution, given that I don't have enough information because we have you know, I have an under un, un, underdetermined. Uh, set of equations <clears throat> so this would happen in the case where you have a small number of observables but you have a large large time series uh, so m your m is very big so the number of points in time series is large now you can always um uh, add observables to your set so in principle you know this never really has to happen because you can always add nonlinear functions that are that are independent of the ones that you include in your library in order to make the, the, the system either determined or overdetermined. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, but in some cases, uh, for example, you're measuring, you're, you're, you're having a numerical solution of a velocity field, and that measures velocity in many, many different points. These are the observables that you have in your system. Um, but you can simulate it for a very long, amount of time m in that case you have a lot more observables than m and so in that case the the system is is over determined because uh, because no, you know, the number the, the, the time dimension is less than uh, the the number of functions that you have and that's harder to um, that's harder to uh, make uh, you know determined you would have to collect more data in time but again this solution here has an interpretation and that is that it's the closest in least square sense to f prime the true solution in the next time step in the span of the columns of f right so in that situation you have something like this um, let's say this is the span of your functions you have you have your observables that you obtained over here and that spans this this plane p but then the next observation is here and so really the solution that you're getting is the closest this this solution here is the closest that you can you can obtain in the plane that was spanned by the information that you already have the data that you have already the data that you have already correct co collected all right so we shouldn't forget what f prime is f prime is the data matrix at the next time step so it contains the data at, at time two three four five all the way up to n but but also it it has this unobserved uh, part which is the next part in time so in some sense we are in, in, in this approach we're in, in f prime there is one column that we really kind of don't know <clears throat> so we can attempt to reconstruct the first 
n minus one elements of that and then kind of predict the last one. But of course there is a residual. You're not going to be able to predict perfectly with this if the problem is, um, is underdetermined or, or overdetermined in this, in this sense. So what can we do? So we're gonna, we're gonna take off from, uh, from this formula over here. Fp prime is Fa lambda A inverse. So first let's talk briefly about um, A inverse. So A inverse is the matrix in which rows are the, the Koopman modes. The Koopman modes, of course, I scale them so that they are really just the left um, eigenvectors. And so they're A1 to A n hat. <clears throat> and then lambda A inverse is this lambda one tilde to lambda n tilde multiplying A1 to A n hat because lambda is a diagonal matrix. Remember, we have distinct eigenvalues. And then um, FA is the multiplication of the data matrix and A, remember A is the matrix that has eigenvectors as columns. So when you multiply these two, for each row you get the vector of observables multiplying. Remember this is a dot product between a set of functions and the vector. So this is what that looks like. But remember that product is just the approximation to an eigenfunction. So each of these is approximation to an eigenfunction evaluated at different points along the trajectory. All right. So now FK tilde itself is at, at XL is FK tilde of X1 multiplied by lambda k tilde l minus one, right? That's applying the finite section, uh, the finite section um, uh, l minus one times. This is what, this is what we obtain, right? Um, so, I mean, in particular, fk tilde of x1 is one times fk tilde of, of of x1. So at, this, at, at, at the first you know, application of this, you get basically the, the original, um, the value back. So putting this all together, so taking fa and lambda a inverse, you get this, that fp prime is fa lambda a inverse. Um, and that turns out from these two, just multiplying this with that, you get the eigenvalue, you get the eigenfunction, and you get the mode. And this is really the triple that we've seen so many times before. And it turns out that here you have really the, the, the reconstruction of the data and, and, and also you know, a, a prediction of some sort for the next for the next time step, but as I said, it's not entirely accurate. It actually has a residual that uh, we're going to talk about. So um, often the finite section is also named the Galerkin, Galerkin projection in the case when, um, when we don't have the orthonormal uh, basis vectors, it would be the, Petrov-Galerkin, that's, uh, that's kind of nomenclature for that. 